Tatum. Fenwick. Um, fin Fenwick. Flexible m meaning there's no specific spell list, you just describe the effect you want. Oh, I understand. Yeah, um... I think it makes it a little... Magic, as an idea, I mean, it's literally limited by your imagination. You can do pretty much anything with it. Um, so flexible spell systems are interesting in that they give you more, more of that range. But then if you go and read literally every spell in all of D&D, there's a lot of range there already. I'm not sure it's... It's more of a difference of degree, and it's not like substantially different. It's not a difference of kind. It is interesting, though. Um, also, I guess, in my case, at a certain point in d, &D you start making up a lot of house-ruled spells to fill in ideas that are like roughly similar to other spells, but just a little different. So it doesn't seem substantially different to me. Hmm. Um, Jotu King, there's chess because this we're doing a QA. and a uh, The thing actually needed, I forgot to change the title, I'm not going to change it now. Uh, but like the, the, this is basically a Q&A for Honor Bound, the Nation of the New God. Uh, just, we just finished with our fifth uh, starter campaign and we're answering questions uh, of that session or just Dungeon Dragons 5th edition general questions or just role playing questions. It's it's a Q and A. Just feel free to ask ask questions if you want to. We have a very very big uh, veteran over here in in the role playing shows, uh, role playing games. So make use of him, and I can I I'll, I'll pitch in wherever I can. Oh shit! That's that's not nice. This is what I was going for, for the yeah, record. Yeah, I know, I know. But let's see. Okay. Let's see if this works. Now I have a rook versus your queen. I think I can do this. Except my positioning is awful. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm counting on. Hmm. Question, Justin. You said that you've played GURPS. How much experience do you have with it, and what are your thoughts on it? Um, I played GURPS for about a year extensively when I was at a boarding school. My roommate had it. I don't know, had a lot of the source material. Um, I will forever be grateful to GURPS for giving us Malazan Book of the Fallen. I don't know if you guys have read Malazan Book of the Fallen, but it started out as a GURPS campaign. My mm. personal experience with it. It's really interesting to me that you could, in theory, put any world you wanted into the system and it would, it would work. It gives you that framework. And uh, one of the ways I always explain D&D to people when they ask me, like, what's the point? What are you really doing? Is it's collective storytelling and the rules give you an idea for the consequences of your actions. And GURPS just does that for any world you could ever want to build. It gives, gives you an idea of what the consequences of your actions might be. And it encourages you, in a lot of ways, to rewrite the rules or change them to reflect how you think the world works and personal biases. So in that sense, I've always found it really interesting to play it with people, especially if they're DMing, uh, because it gives me an insight into who they are as a person, which is totally unrelated to the game. Um, That's, I think it's related to the game as well. And uh, just how they see the world. Yeah, I, I, I think basically the social side of it, like knowing somebody is like one big part of the game, because in the end it is a social game. So you do get to know somebody by, by playing D&D with them. Like, my opinion, at least. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, oh, more questions. So, um, how do you intend to keep... Oh, so, basically, we're going to do about four or five weeks, uh, I think, of this. Um, this, like, starter set, like, Lost Minds of Fadelver. And after we finish, like basically when the PHB and the player's handle comes out, that's when we're gonna come out with Honor Bound, our actual campaign. Like the the one set in the world of Sarum, that's gonna go on indefinitely. We we don't know how much. We don't have any timeline for it. Just a new D and D fifth show. Uh, do you always like to RP as much as possible, or do you do it less among casual groups? Um, Justin, you go first on this one. I like to RP as much as my character requires. 
Uh, I find this, if it's a long-term campaign, as I get better acquainted with my character, I will RP more, especially if the DM like is creating a world where it's possible. If it's like a one-shot, um, it's harder. It's easier to play like goofy characters. I think I RP more. I, I spend just as much time on RP, but the RP is mostly goofy as opposed to like really trying to develop my character. Um, some groups don't like RP. If they don't, I won't do it. I remember one time it was uh, I was playing a one shot in 4E, and I was a we were searching a train, and for some reason I was the only person that could detect the thing we was stolen that we were looking for. And the DM expected us to go through the train in like 10 minutes. I spent an hour playing this doddering old senile warforged, <laughs> like clunking around this train, making sure we got every compartment, checking for everything. And everyone had a really great time, which is the the point. I think the when you're RPing, the, the key thing to be aware of is whether the group's having fun. As long as the group's having fun, you're RPing the right amount. If your groups get bored, you're RPing too much. If people say there's too much combat, then you're not RPing enough. There's always a there's a balance there, and it just depends on the group you're with and the context of the campaign. I try to be socially sensitive. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, I think uh, I, I like RPing. Uh, again, like that's the best way to say it as much as the character requires. Uh, but uh, the RP side of it is one of is the one of our favorite things. Like the combat is just a thing, but I don't think combat is a major thing. Like I th I think combat in itself is an RP ability as well. Like it's an RP opportunity, not ability. Um, and it depends on like you can watch, you can just watch what like our fifth just a fifth campaign. Like, look at the combat. I mean, there's so much RP in it. If if you look at it, there's not just oh I go I go I go swat at him I go I do that on him I I, I heal this guy it's it was so more so more active so more like interaction of characters and so uh, and teamwork like teamwork kind of makes the RP more possible as well um, it depends on the groups like for for example live games. Uh, when you do live games, it depends on the kind of group you have. Like, if you have a casual group, it's more of a sh social gathering. I think Neil said this once. It's basically, what he does about what he does with his live group is like one hour or two hours of D and D, and like two hours of dick jokes and poop jokes. <laughs> like, it's 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 fun because it's like a social gathering. It's like a social side of it, and that's basically it for some players. And for other groups, they're very hardcore into it. So it depends with the group. Uh, but I, I think RP is one of the major points of it. Like for example, if you, you guys should know like Divinity Original Sin, I think it's so good of a game because they have a created world and about like about two decades of work and like from Divinity or um, Divine Divinity that I've played a couple dozen times. Um, coming to Divine Divinity Original Sin, they have this whole range of uh, RP abilities. So I think RP like kind of adds a lot to the game. Even if okay, let's say it doesn't add anything technically, it's still a something very big that you can feel the lack of where where it isn't. Uh, do you think there is a point to one shots? Yes, it's they're fun, they're short. You get to kill stuff. You get to do go through a nice dungeon. Uh, as I said, he has, as Justin said, uh, I'll get goofy characters. So it's always a point to a one shot. It depends, like if you like it or if somebody else likes it or if your group likes it. That's I mean, that's who decides if there's a point to a one shots. One shots are really useful. You can like introduce people to the idea of playing the game, which is I mean we're not doing a one shot, but we're doing the inner the introduction campaign for 5e just so we can sort of learn the rule set and decide how we feel about different classes before we build our permanent characters for the long-term campaign. Um, if you're DM sick and you still want to meet up and play D&D, someone can whip out a one-shot. If you just want to hang out with friends and play some D&D, a one-shot's a really easy thing to do. One-shots are useful for all sorts of things. Um, it's just, I usually, if I'm, if I'm actively in a D&D group, I will usually have at least one or two one-shots laying around that I've written up like scripts for and also, a lot of people will play through a campaign from like 1 to 10 or 1 to 12 or whatever and it'll fall apart or people will die and they never get to the higher levels and they always wanted to play their characters at a higher level or play with their group at a higher level. You can do a one-shot. It's like level 18 or level 21. It's fun. You get to see where you would have been if your campaign hadn't fallen apart. Yep. <laughs> oh, Justin, question for you. 
What race and class do you play the most? What fits your style the most? Um, I don't know. First, I either tend to play a magic user or something that has an option for like being quick and agile. I play a lot of rangers. Um, I play a lot of wizards. I usually don't play fighters or like straight melee types. I might play a rogue. Um, my rogues usually have pretty boring backstories. I like bards. I play a lot of bards. They're not good. I just like playing them. <laughs> but it fits well, my style the most. I'm not. I know somebody, some one of my player who will love you for that. I, I, think, I yeah, I have I, think, I have a friend that like he loves bards. He plays ev everywhere. He just plays bards. I think I'll, what I do, in a lot of cases, is I actually think up a character and then try and match the character to the system I'm playing, whatever fits them best. So if it's, you know, it's someone who's a wise old sage or someone who's a little insane, I would probably go with a magic user. And you know, if it's someone who's like a loner or recalcitrant, I would go with a, a ranger. If it's someone who has anger issues, I might go with someone who just likes to smash things. <laughs> You know, although it is funny to play an angry wizard. It, it, angry wizards are funny. Yeah. These or... things develop over time. I'm not sure I have a style. I like, like I had certain characters when I started playing D that I like the idea of, but I've been playing it for so many years. I want to play something I've never played before, and in my case, that involves going further and further out of like the normal. Yeah. So I've never played an actor before, for the record. So dwarf actor, this is gonna be fun. I gotta, uh... I'm gonna work that in some more. One of the races that I really find interesting to play was um, the Drows. If you've ever played the Drow, I have played Drow. It's it's I've an actually, interesting race. I've actually played a, a, a like a high priest of the Spider Queen. Ooh, drow. Interesting. I, I tried really a um, a basically personality deranged Drow. How would you tell the difference from a normal Drow and a deranged it's, personality? Um, it, it's Basically, it was chaotic neutral in a way, so it did whatever the fuck it wanted. So it had like enemies on both sides, but it just continued on doing anything. It just like fucked around with everybody, and it was interesting because uh, in the end, I actually had a very good idea of what uh, what the character is and who the character is, and I, everybody would like would know would have this like character psychology of it, and it seemed random. It wasn't, and I it was one of the most coincidental characters that I played because I didn't mean it to get into this to, to go up into that but it did because when you have a good group and a good DM and a good world uh, things kind of tend to just weave together and even if you don't want them to okay uh, have you ever made a custom uh, monster waste for D&D. Yes. I have worked it. I mean, when you fuck around with like... Some, you, sometimes you just like, want to fuck around with your idea and just take like the rules and integrate it in the world. So yeah, I, I've created uh, custom monsters, stress races. Uh, have you, Justin? I've made a lot of custom monsters. Um, I haven't made as many custom uh, like player character classes, player character races, um, just because there's usually so much material out there that if there's someone who's, if you have a player who's looking for something really specific, you can make it up, you can like play with half races, or you can transfer different racial stats around. I don't think I've ever made up one um, completely that wasn't already in the D&D universe. A lot of custom monsters though, tons of custom monsters. That's just part of being a DM, I think. Yep. Um, so do you fight? Uh, so you guys feel the healing style is okay now since the fighter and any class can heal themselves. Does that kind of take the healing cleric to more of a battle cleric? Well, you're playing the cleric, Justin. Why you want to answer that? <laughs> I think healing is fine so far. Um, I actually like the second wind ability. Uh, it gives fighters something to do, and I 
don't like the idea of like having to carry around wands of cure light wounds so you have enough healing to recover day after day after day. It's it's silly. There ought to be ways of healing that you can like keep the story moving. Um, as long as it's not excessively excessive amounts of in combat healing, but I think the fighter being able to do it once per encounter is pretty reasonable. Or once per short rest. So if they, you could even if the DM wanted to pressure the group, they could just not let them take a short rest somehow. There's always a a way of forcing people to yeah, you you just need to um, just need to keep that in mind because if you do allow it, it can become a a bit OP. But then again, it's 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 easy to to work with it. It's really easy to work with it. Shit. I have an idea of what I want to do here, but I'm not sure at all. Not sure if I want to do it. Oh, this is interesting. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. So, I think now in kind of equal grounds. Sort of. Yeah, I managed to even it out a little bit. Yeah. He have one more than me. I, I think I fucked up on that move. I, I didn't see the I didn't see the horse coming in. Um, That's okay, I didn't see your bishop, so we're even. <laughs> we're even. Uh what are some of your favorite constant monsters you made? How did the prayers fare against him? you can you can go first on that one. Um I've never like made an encounter that was impossible. To, to win, so my players usually fared fairly well. Um, not even impossible, I've never made an encounter that I didn't think the players I was actually playing with could do well against. But I think I made a custom encounter once that had um, it had ice giants on one side and fire giants on the other side. And they were hurling rocks at each other, like, well, frozen bits of ice from the ice giants and flaming boulders from the other side. And they would randomly come down in the middle of this battlefield, and they were f they were fighting a bunch of caterpillars, like really, really tiny. It's like a swarm of caterpillars with a distributed intelligence. And they were crawling on them and in them, and the rocks were coming down randomly. And in theory, they could like swing at them, and it would do X amount of damage. And if they killed enough caterpillars, the thing would not be intelligent anymore and would devolve so they were just trying to kill as many as they possibly could hmm, that's uh, interesting it, it, there's a whole there's a reason this makes sense it was very invested in the campaign out of context it just sounds really weird um but if enough of them if enough of the calibers got to where they were going they were on like a migration they would turn into this swarm of death butterflies that would be intelligent and would uh encompass the world so the the, the giant fighting the was, un, an unre, was an unrelated plot point because they happened to be in the middle of a planar war. Uh, it, it's complicated. <laughs> I like things that overlap. <laughs> and, and nice to think about the apocalypse bring, brought on by butterflies, caterpillars, <laughs> caterpillars yeah, and butterflies. Caterpillars and butterflies. <laughs> it's it's second only to the apocalypse is brought on by kittens. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, well, custom monsters, um, let me think, favorite custom monster, um, um, custom monsters, but I, I wanna, I like to play around, for example, with, um, with creatures that are already there and just, like, I just change them around completely, um, like, for example, if you know the, um, Displacer Beasts that Neo used once, I think, in the, uh, in the second edition, Sarm. Whatever. I I I I took a displacer beast and basically made it uh, half Hydra, half half displacer beast. So it was very interesting side because they, it was very hard to kill. You just needed to a lot of teamwork around, 
around it to cut off its heads and use fire on them so they don't they don't come back and at the same time hear the prayers that are facing them because there's a lot of attacks coming their way uh, and they need to keep on defenses as well so like it's I know I blew it it's um, like I, I, I like to fuck around with the things in DND 3.5 because it's like five, almost five I think in total monster manuals with a lot of monsters and I have not tried all of them there's there's a lot of them and I haven't tried all of them I haven't gone through all of them yet besides I will never go through Sionix I just I don't like Sionix it's something I have against Sionix like Aerophids and and Brain Eaters I just don't enjoy them at all Am I don't know? Do you, do you have you played with Psionics? I have played with Psionics. Um, Psionics, in my experience, they get a lot of like overlap. Like, there's people who have ESP and there's people who have telekinesis, and you want to want to define each of those very clearly and what they do. Um, and I know in D and D they've always in D and D, in my opinion, they've always been really weird. Like in other systems, they're fine, but in D and D, for some reason, they always end up being really strange. Yeah, I I agree with you. That's why. I for for a couple like for almost one year, uh, so I do not allow D and D like do I do not allow Sionix in my games. Um, any favorite heroes of the Forgotten Realms? Uh, I need to go with a classic here. Uh, Dritz Dwarden. I think it's in the Forgotten Realms. I'm not sure, but I think he's one of the drows that yeah I I, I just like Dritz Dwarden. He's one of those guys that. It's it's like a childhood story. It's it's an archetype. It's simple, but I just like him. I just simply like him. Do you have anybody in the Forgotten Realms that uh, you have a passion for? Um, uh, hmm. oh, what's his name? Halaster Blackcloak. Right, he's the the insane guy who ruled Undermountain. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yes, that guy was fun. Put it at the least. He was, he was just. Uh, I like the unpredictability um, of him. Have you read? Uh, I think there's been some books on him. As well. I've read years and years and years ago. Yeah. Um. Did you have an encounter that one of the characters shouldn't have survived but did anyway? <laughs> yeah. Because the dice work that way sometimes. Yes, yeah, that's that's the question. That's your answer. Suck day. That's it happens. We, you know, we live in a Cisco universe controlled by random forces. D and D is a Cisco universe controlled by dice. Sometimes shit happens that it makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> hmm. Threads. Yes, yes, yes. Fans are right. delight, but it's awesome. Um. Well, I think I think I've missed anything. So yeah, feel free to put up more questions. Um, are, we, are we just gonna raise our, our peons back to the end <laughs> and get our queens back? That's that's what we wanna do here. <laughs> Interesting. I told you I couldn't beat a Romanian at chess. <laughs> uh, let's see, I can still make mistakes. Um, yeah, oh, no, that was questions. A mistake. no questions yet. I, I resign. Ah, uh, yes. I win. I win. Nice. Good game. Good game, yeah. Very good game. Okay, uh, so. What's the time? So, so we still have another like half hour to to go on for stuff. 
So what would you like to do in this half hour? I don't know. What do you guys? What do you usually do when you're streaming? Uh, I I just like I I either do D and D. This this basically my my stream is D and D or some games that I do like Divinity Original Sin. I've been playing on hard on hardcore. If you had Steam, we could play some some Divinity. That's a very good game. Hmm. Any good RPG stories that come to mind? Ooh. Like from like from personal play? You mean? Uh, I think yeah. Like I think for us, from our experience. Um, yeah, go on, go on first. Or you want to you want to think about it? Okay, so one time we had a girl in our group, and she <laughs> didn't. Uh, she didn't show up once for a day, but we decided we were gonna keep playing with her her character. And her and her character was a dragonborn, and it was actually Ryan. Ryan was playing a, a dragonborn, and. We gave them like a 5% chance of hooking up because he got drunk and we were at a bar. <laughs> what sorts? Literally give them a 5% chance of, of hooking up. And I rolled a, rolled a d20, got a 20 on his seduction check. And then she came back the next week and we explained what had happened to her. And she was a little horrified and a little, uh, a little offended, but it was, it was funnier because Neil had been trying to hook this girl and Ryan up in real life as kind of like a joke for like a year. <laughs> and after that, Link, after that, Neil stopped because it had been done. It, it worked. He, it, it would never happen again because we already got the, uh, you know, the one in 20 chance. <laughs> <laughs> I, she died before we could determine pregnancy. I thought about it. Interesting. Yeah, that, was a rough, that was a rough campaign. I think I think the funniest the funniest stories you remember aren't so much in game. No matter how much you work on it, it's it's the interpersonal connections that you remember. Yep. Um, best thing that happened one time is uh, I was playing with a f with a friend that came here from uh, Germany, and uh, he speaks speak good English, and for, like for the whole part of the game. I thought he, he was a female, but he's actually a male in his character. There's so many interactions that he didn't get because he couldn't really understand English. So he kind of behaved weirdly. And after we went through it, like, almost at the end of the session, he realized, wait, like you know I'm a female, right? In the game. And I was like, Sh shit, what? <laughs> and and just <laughs> we just thought about it and every little thing just made us a lot more fun you know, after. Um, yeah, that was a fun one. Like and an in-game one that I liked very much was when our bard uh, just walked between like a group of elves and a group of orcs that were about to fight, and he did enthrall in the 3.5. So basically, when he had the attentions of all of them and they were not yet fighting, they were kind of looking at him and being distracted by any by everything else. So he basically stopped. A whole orc uh, elven attack, like just almost war, by just praying his root <laughs> and using him for all. This is a very, very nice thing. That's happened actually in Eye of the Storm, and the VOD might still be there out there. I think it's week four or something like that. It's on the, it's on YouTube if it, if it is there. But that bard over, that bard is amazing. Uh, Gary, um, that's that's the guy I was talking to you about. Um, Gary loves bards, and he's actually ha he actually has a pretty good bard. And three point five does actually give you opportunity to play a pretty powerful bard, if you if you know how to do it. Like he basically he, he just avoids most of the encounters, and he uses his spells and his items in order to uh, accomplish his objective without necessarily fighting people and killing stuff, which is a, a good way to approach it. It's a harder way. And I think it brings out the best in a player when you're trying to approach a situation with the idea that you you cannot face this thing in battle. So how are you gonna kill it? I'm trying to think of other ones. Oh, uh, there was one. It was actually an epic level campaign in I think it was in 3.0. The um, there's two guys, one was playing a male character and one was playing a female character. 
and the uh, the paladin who's the male character had fallen in love with the female character and they were in this the the big bad evil guy's citadel <sighs> and they discovered that there was a a trap that was going to completely destroy the citadel and everything in it which was okay because the big bad evil guy was still in it we had set up like a teleportation anchor so they couldn't he couldn't teleport away but someone had to set off the self destruct mechanism and the the female player, the female character volunteered, and everyone else uh, ran for the door, or so she thought. But the paladin actually uh, stayed behind and prayed to his god to trade his life for hers because he was in love with her uh, for reasons that had been building up for like three years. This was a long campaign. And his nice. god, his god intervened, and the paladin died like real death. Never, we we uh, we couldn't res him because he his god that was part of the 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 price of his god saving this woman's life. It was really interesting because you have these two guys, but they're role playing this like one sided love affair. Yep, that's a, that's a, that's a very nice story. It's a very nice story. Uh, we missed a couple of questions, so. Um... So, taking a lot uh, of the flank attack bonus, surprise, and other bonuses, do you like new advantage and advantage system? Eh, it's not bad. Uh, it's not great. But I have nothing against it now. I like it. Uh, what I think it, I think it's a bit better, like simplified from like 3.5 where we had like flank gives you 2, surprise gives you 4, that gives you another, and you always need to check them because you might fuck them up. Yeah, advantage, disadvantage is really nice. I mean, it's an average bonus of 3.5, I think, but if you take into account the fact that most of the numbers you're aiming for are between, like, rolling an 8 or a 14 on the die, somewhere in that range, it's actually closer to plus 5. Uh, so, it's a bigger bonus on average than, like, a standard plus 2 would be. And at the low end and the high end, it's still pretty reasonable. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I think it's you risk more for it, which kind of makes up for the fact that you can either fail very badly or win when you roll, roll like a 1 and a 20 and if you have an advantage you, you roll a 20. It's pretty nice. Um, let's see, would you like to have more cannon playable races? You can take this one first. Uh, eventually, it'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I like the fact. I do like the one thing they did with with the. Uh, they started doing this late in 4e as the sub races. I just like the idea of having different races, the same race that has like different origins. They do have because this humans in have sub races. Yeah, they do, they do have this in 3.5, which is actually very well made. Like you have, for example, like for the dwarves at least, you have about ten sub races for the dwarves. And the works and like there are a lot of races in 3.5. That's why I like 3.5 a lot because like you have a lot of content. Like some of it is good, some of it is bad, but you have a lot released by wizards in the 3.5 world and a lot of settings. I just love I love having a lot of content and choosing what I work with instead of having to like less and I cannot really have anything to work with. Like, I, I just enjoy that. Like that, uh, when somebody asks asks me if 3.5 or, uh, or Pathfinder, I say Pathfinder is always better, but I'm always gonna say 3.5. Like Pathfinder is more balanced. It's 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 easier to. It's just an easier system and better in some ways. But for me, 3.5 is always gonna be my system because I I, I just love it. I, I I know it. I I feel like home I, at home with it. But saying that, I've played a lot of other role-playing systems as well, like Mutants and Masterminds, like a very nice um, uh, heroes uh, system. Then you have like the Warhammer systems, which are good as well, uh, and all the other like dungeon mode and these um, are Numenara, are very good systems that I've tried. Anyway, let's go on. So, question: um, Would you like to? Uh, Question to Justin: Has Neil ever successfully played a awful good character? He seems to very be, to be to be pretty bad at this these days. Uh yeah, we've had lawful good parties. Um, and Neil Neil can role play anything, but it's one of those things where if you've done it for years and years and years, everyone starts out playing the good guys. Um, I've actually met this is strange to me. I've met very few people 
in my experience with D&D in general, who have had evil campaigns where they played the bad guys or played people like of entirely evil alignment and they had no qualms about, you know, killing. And It wasn't necessarily that they killed randomly, it's just that they killed when it served their purposes and they just didn't care. Um, which is strange to me. It's one of the best things that you can do, I think, to really learn how to play good characters, to play evil ones and understand where they're diverging. Uh, but Neil can play lawful good characters. He just doesn't do it as much anymore because he's done that. He wants to do other things, which is something, I said something very similar about earlier about wanting to play different characters that I've just never played before. Yep. Um, when do you owe advantage? Um, you don't owe advantage, you have advantage in certain situations and advantage means that you owe two dice and pick the biggest one. Uh, you have advantage in a couple of situations when you surprise somebody, you have advantage. Uh, and when somebody else helps you, you have an advantage. Like there was an action that people can take, just help somebody in their attack, like basically faint or do anything in order to help your friend, so your friend gets an advantage. Like for example, if example you have a cleric, it gets you, and it's Feinwick to the side, and there's a big boss, and you sh you know that you can't do enough damage, but he may do enough damage. So instead of uh, attacking, you use your action to help, and he gets advantage on it. So that's an advantage has a lot of situations. Uh, there's a couple more that don't come to mind right now that I know are in the basic rules, but more will be released with the PHB anyway. I imagine at some point there will be like flanking will give you advantage, or if they yeah. introduce spacing. But you in the basic rule set, they tried to make it slim down as simple as possible. So, uh, and you don't have advantage when you have an ally next to you. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Unless, as I said, they do help, for example. Are there rules for skills in the basic rules, PDF, or do you need to buy them with a starter set? Uh, I haven't really looked through the basic one very much, but uh, I think there are skills there. I'm not sure. I, I couldn't really answer you. Uh, I know there are skills in the, um, in the starter set because you get them like over here. So, that you get them there. But I'm not sure if uh, it's basic. But you can. I mean, why ask me? Go to Wizards. You can download it for for free. It's it's open to everybody. So go and find out for yourself. Um. No, there are no detailed things like these. Maybe there are a couple of DCs. They usually kind of give like the basic ones. But sometimes like DCs and stuff like this is just like a DM thing. So you just keep in mind what the already like decided DCs are, and you have a custom situation. You just best knowledge, best best your best judgment on it. Yeah, exactly. When uh, down to DM's call. Okay, and uh, again we're out of questions. So I'm gonna ask you just a question. So. What, what do you think this uh, this campaign is going? What's what's gonna happen with uh, with this adventure? Like the one shot or the honor the bound shots. Of the, new the one shots. We can talk about the other one after. The one shot. I think the one shot will be interesting. Um, it takes a little while for groups to like gel um, and understand what their roles are gonna be. Um, and I know Ryan takes a little while to like get comfortable with the system, um, get comfortable with his characters. Neil's much better at just jumping right in, uh, but I think it's because, especially just because he's a streaming personality, he kind of has to be that way at this point. Yep. Um, and I I really like knowing my systems. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Uh, but um, what, what storyline, where do you expect this to be going from what you know right oh, now? Oh, I don't know. I imagine we'll rescue the dwarves. I'll, I imagine, just based on the simplicity of the writing, that they were kidnapped from for someone. Like, it wasn't that the they got kidnapped because they were on the road. They were targeted in some way. Um, and that'll give you a hook to expand it after we go to wherever the next castle it's a castle right the castle Grim. cragmaw yeah castle cragmaw like that'll give you a hook to expand the story further because whenever they do like introductory campaigns like this they always leave hooks so that you can continue it on as your own campaign if you want to um i think i think it's supposed to link up to like level 
five. It's supposed to go up all the way to level five, right? So Castle Kragma is probably like Act Two. There's probably at least one other dungeon type thingy. Um, if the map was to an artifact of some kind, then I imagine at the very end we'll either discover the artifact or discover the artifact is missing or it has a guardian that can't be killed or it has a guardian that we'll have to kill it if we want to get it, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Okay, interesting guesses. We see we see how right he is, uh, or how wrong he is, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and by the way, guys, uh, just remember that even if it's a starter set and even if it's here, it, not, it doesn't mean it will be 100% like it's here. I'm gonna change, like, I have already changed a couple of stuff and I will be changing, like, all the stuff that I feel like need to be changing or just I feel more comfortable with changing. So, when you know that, for example, a chest is not locked, you don't need to, you don't need to jump in chat. The chest is not locked, it says in the book. No, it's locked because I said so. <laughs> I mean, the starter set in every rule book is, remember, it's guidelines, and necessarily the what, down to swab, the, the commandments of God. This is, this is God. Like, this little thing right here. This is God. I'm actually showing the dice, but you don't see it. <laughs> okay, uh, and now let's talk, before we take questions, we will take the questions that you guys put in, so just put in some questions and we will take them one by one. I'm gonna ask you, what do you think about like, just the name of it? What do you think the campaign in Solemn will be for, like? Just good judging by the name and whatever you know about the group, like, you feel like it's gonna go. Hmm. I think it'll actually be really interesting. I'm, I'm sort of curious to explore the idea of redemption. I'm thinking about my character's backstory already. And what an awful person he's been. Um, it'll, I, I've played evil characters, I've played good characters. I don't think I've ever played a character who is bad and had an experience. He was actively trying to like become good or, or right uh, his wrongs. I've had characters who had bad things happen to them and they were trying to fix the things that happened to them. But I don't think I've ever played a character who like did something, really did a number of things that were really, really bad and he wanted to like make the world a better place. It'll be an interesting dynamic, especially if the entire party is like that. Yeah. Um, especially if we conflict about what we think is a better world because we're so morally ignorant that we don't understand what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be interesting It'll be to see. really interesting. That's really not up to me. Like, what do you guess, friend? It's, that's really, like, I couldn't know anything about that. Um, like, you know what Neil said about the feel, like, good characters, triangle, like, the redemption, of course. Yeah. Uh, is in the name, so it implies that it will be part of the campaign. But uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see what the characters they create, and when the characters die, what new characters come up. <laughs> 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 okay, so let's start with some questions because we have some piled up. Um, what is the highest level spell you've ever cast? I think myself as a prayer. I have I have had level twenty epic campaigns, so I have cast everything that there is. And but I think like the spell compendium was one of the real, like one of the real awesome things that I liked about three point five is like you have uh, just bringing it up to get to get certain something. Um, you have like this basic sheet of spells with a lot of spells in it, but then you have like a spell compendium with like 15 or like 10, 15 pages on like all the spells and alternative spells, not the ones you get, like just completely different ones. And it's interesting to see that. Uh, and let me find that spell exactly. So you go just and ask that question until I find this. Well, as a DM, I've created Whole Worlds, which is a god level spell. I'm pretty sure that's <laughs> infinite. <laughs> as a player, I think the highest spell I've ever cast was like level 34. Um. I think that was in first edition. I don't remember what the spell was. Ah, this is this is what I really liked. Uh, one of the spells that I had so much fun with, Awaken Construct. Like it's level nine. It's not that big, but it's oh god, I had so much fun with this. Basically, there was this town that was a, there were a lot of statues in it. So, 
at a certain point when we got higher levels, uh, I just I just in the night I would go outside and awaken construct or the statues and explain to them my plan that and in, in this is this big villain coming here and it's army and we need some help with him. With it's just, we're gonna let him get inside and then you guys do your thing. And I awakened about one hundred and forty two statues in that whole city. So when this guy came in, we just we we sent all the people outside in caves, just and we were waiting for them. And like, see like an army of like three hundred people just marched into town. And like the leader was very smug about it. Like this, you, this is this is what I'm supposed to be. Ah, this is gonna be easy. And I I remember I even now remember when I poof I I, I knock my finger and about 100 statues kind of come rushing down on them is we we didn't lift a finger we literally didn't lift a finger we're just looking at them and they all died it was amazing <laughs> uh, and and like wow. being there is a lot better than hearing about it because they sound that amazing when you hear about it um okay do you prefer playing slash DMing when the party at all levels, mid levels, high levels, and no preference? Um, I prefer playing at mid levels generally in D and D. I find that the most balance again. Lower levels, there's too it's too swingy. There's too much incidence of random death. Um, like I would never, I wouldn't start most D and D campaigns below level three for any edition, honestly, unless it was a brand new system or I had brand new players. Um, like 4E, I think. Like 11 to 16 was the sweet spot. All the games in there was really good. There was enough content to be interesting and enough uh, mechanical things to make your characters really interesting. High levels things just get really broken. It's hard to keep up with an epic party. It takes a lot of work to keep up with what an epic party can do in any edition. Um, for DMing, or for playing, I just hate low levels. <laughs> Mid or high. As long as I have a good DM. I just don't. Like lower levels tend to be pretty uh, stretched and boring in any edition, which is th the point because it's supposed to slowly introduce you to the uh, the world and the ideas and everything. Uh okay. Well, I I lost like after that question, guys. That that the questions were lost because uh, my my Twitch kind of broke and now I just refreshed oh, it. I, so I got oh, you got him. So which yeah. which is the next one? Uh, have you had groups that ended up fighting each other over the game? I've had groups that ended up fighting each other in the game. Uh, like, disagreements between BCs escalated to actual combat. Like, I had to knock out one of Neil's characters once when we were playing. Oh. Um, I've never had a group fight, like, over the game in real life. That would be weird. That would be, like, you stole my Cloud Song level of, uh, no. It's never happened to me. <laughs> No, me neither. Like we all fight, never, and like a lot of my guys are live, uh, like live uh, online, uh, not live. So I wouldn't say I have. I've had that many opportunities on it, but it have been grudges. I've seen people keep grudges, but that's the extent of it. And Neil played a halfling that dual wielded. Was that a class bonus? Do you get an advantage? Um, so you can. Attack with your offhand weapon is a bonus action. If it's a you light weapon. If it's, if yeah. And you don't get proficiency. So that's the, the downside, is which is technically minus two, because normally you would get plus two prof proficiency. And you don't get bonus damage, so you don't get, like, stat the damage, it's just a flat die. At least that's how it is in the starter set. We'll see what the final version of, like, in the player's handbook. And one last question. What's your favorite monster to kill PCs? Beholders. Beholders are nice. I I like Beholders. I, I enjoy more uh, a Medusa. I enjoy Medusas. I like making them feel like something is going to happen or going to get away it's like, because they can disguise themselves as beautiful uh, women and then they stare into your eyes and you turn to stone. It's the most amazing thing ever. I've done it to, to a player. Uh, he saw this some big, beautiful-looking girl, and uh, in a in a cave, uh, just chained with her face to the wall. And he goes to unchain her and turns her around, and like, fuck! And he failed his fortitude check. And <laughs> it was turned into stone. It was interesting. 
Mm. Also, it's fun. level drain is the best way to really kill PCs by pieces. So anything that has level drain, you just a yeah. little bit at a time. You just which chip, is, chip, chip away at their self confidence. Which is uh, which is a very powerful, and you can use those because they they have the few actui, and they are usually very powerful mages. So you should have like energy drains, a lot of energy drains, a lot of spell drains, and that oh, level drains and that. So which is very nice, and they're very hard to kill, especially if they kind of have their fear entry hidden away, and you don't know where it is. You basically kill it, and you know it's gonna come back. And you, until you find the fear entry, so it's always gonna follow you. Uh, Erifed and behold the mount. No, Erifed, I don't like Erifeds. I I do not like Erifeds. I, I I feel like Erifeds are a bit too much. Like Erifeds just are gonna eat your brain. It's, it's that's not nice, just not just a bit too much. Um, I feel like the Tarask is a bit overprayed. I don't know why, but I hear this from everybody. I've I've played it a couple of times, but I don't know. I, I don't feel like the Tarask is necessarily such a big and scary monster. It depends on how you imagine it. I once had a Tarask encounter where. They were fighting the legs because they couldn't see the rest. Of them. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's something as well. Um, okay, well, I think. Uh, oh, epic death. Okay, well, we still have about ten minutes to to go for. Wow, so. what is the most epic death you've had with a character? Um. So there was this, there was this uh, marshal of an army, and he had a lot fewer forces than um, the others had. Like, I think a third. Um, and what happened was that basically he he was a paladin. Um, he he was like the the front line in the vanguard and fought and fought and fought and fought, and in the end. When he, when all, almost all of his forces were dead, and they still had like a couple, twenty or thirty people, um, they, he still went for about ten of them, and then he died. But st like the uh, amount of role playing in that, like the um, the guys, um, how do I put this sentiment at that uh, at those dice, the shouting, the the passion, the. Yes, I've killed it! Okay, there's 10 down, I still have half of my HP, I, I can do this! And then he gets critted a couple of times, he gets feathered by arrows, it, it, it's, it was an epic death because he managed, like, his actions, like, if you want to go into it, saved the party, because, um, he killed mo he killed a lot of so so many people that when the party came with reinforcements, they managed to clear out the evil guy's castle and and capture him and um, rescue the there was a gem of life that was sucking that easily corrupted and was trained to basically suck the life out of uh, earth around itself so it could gather more power. Uh, it was an interesting concept, but and I liked him because this guy knew what's gonna happen in the beginning he knew he had very few chances but he didn't give up until the end uh, at all like at all there was no moment in the game that he didn't have faith even at the end even when there's the rest quit and I was I was at that point I was doing it live like I was not even using my DM or my DM screen because uh, it, it it was a very sentimental uh, moment and I think that those are like the the sentimental moments, the passion the people that put into it, that's what makes an epic death. I'd actually agree with that. I was trying to think of the most mechanically epic death that I've ever had. Which I'm pretty sure involved... Um, so if everyone, everyone, anyone who's read Dune, you know how they control the, the worms with sand hooks that they put into the shell? I had a character try this idea on a dragon once. <laughs> so the dragon every morning would fly out of its cave and go hunting for a little while and come back. My character stood just above the cave, jumped onto its back as it flew out, and implanted these hooks, thinking he, it would allow him to like control the dragon. 
because he could like poke it under the scales and it would be forced to turn one way or the other way. This didn't work at all, except <laughs> what it did was the dragon could no longer rotate its shoulder muscle all the way back, so it couldn't get its head around to bite my character off. So we were sort of like in this Mexican stalemate where I can't let go of these hooks or he'll be able to turn around, but the dragon's having a hard time staying afloat because I'm, I'm hurting its wing muscles. So we're like slowly like floating down to the ground. And I decide that I'm going to rip out the hooks at the, like the last possible second, jump and roll and hook the hooks into its wing as I come down and like throw it with the momentum, right? My character was a half giant. This was maybe barely possible. <laughs> I rolled a natural one on the hooking the wing thing. <laughs> so really, I just jumped straight to my death. <laughs> but, for, but for like five or ten minutes, I was riding a dragon. <laughs> and it couldn't get me off. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay, guys. I, I, think, uh, I think that's going to be it for our Q&A. And remember, we'll be doing this uh, every session after, like, un unless there's like something big that happens, and I really can't do it. But well, I think we're gonna be doing the Q and A's um, every session after, like, maybe with Justin again, maybe with the others, maybe with everybody if we get everybody, or just myself. Um, we're just gonna answer questions about like role playing, as I said, uh, but personal questions like. If if but don't expect necessarily expect to answer to them unless the person does want to answer them. Uh, role playing show role playing questions and so on. Um, yeah, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know the format. You've been here. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this, and we'll be doing it. We'll be seeing you next next honor bound session. And for me, my my own things uh, before I let Justin speak and say goodbye. Um, Next show is gonna be Tuesday, 3.5 Dungeon News. So it's it is like it sounds. It's Dungeon of Dragons 3.5, <laughs> but it's named 3.5 because we have a halfling in in the team. That's that's where we took the name from. Like four people and a halfling. Like three people and a halfling. Anyway, Justin, go. Racist. Racist. Uh, uh, I just want to I just want to say I had fun. It was actually really interesting answering the questions. A lot of the stuff is stuff I haven't thought about in years. It's interesting to have it all trickle back, all the memories. So it was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it as uh, much as I did. And I'll be seeing more of you because I will be with you every week on uh, Honor Bound, Redemption of the New Guard. Yep, great. So, yeah, see you guys later. Bye-bye.